I continue with deviatoric stresses and strains, which are related to that what I just told you before. Only for energy, it was much more evident. And energy, the specific energy is a scalar. It's invariant to coordinate transformation. That is why it's easier to work with in, in many situations. Now, back to the tensors, which we had before. The definition of a deviatoric stress is the total stress tensor minus the hydrostatic stress. So you remember sigma n was the hydrostatic stress, was the stress which is the mean average of over all directions of the normal stresses or isotropic stress or direction independent stress. So I take the total stress and I take the direction independent stress out of it. I remove it. Okay. And if I do that, what remains is the direction dependent stress. So the direction independent stress is a nice object. It's a scalar, it's an invariant here. It becomes a tensor by multiplying it together with the unit matrix. Okay, so if I remove this from my stress, then actually I have a stress which has no first invariant anymore, as you will see later. And this is what we call deviatoric. So isotropic is the second term. I remove it from the total stress and what remains is the so-called deviatoric stress. Okay, the second is just a different way to write it. First invariant with a one over three. Okay, for strain, it's exactly the same definition. Only here you have to be careful whether where you insert the one over three and where you don't. For sigma, we don't. For strain, we do. Because the naming of the first invariant and its relation to hydrostatic or isotropic is slightly different. So this is a small possibility for confusion. Okay. For isotropic strain, this is the sum over all three uh, directional normal strains. Okay, we take the total strain, we remove the direction independent part, and what remains is the direction dependent part, the so called deviatoric strain. And that's it so far. Okay, uh, next slide. Now, since these objects here are tensors, this is a scalar multiplied with a unit matrix, which also behaves like a tensor. Actually, it's invariant under coordinate transformation by definition. So these are two tensors. So on the left-hand side, hopefully we also have a tensor. I don't prove this. It's just a well-grounded hope. Okay, now if you have a tensor, and this is a tensor which is sometimes simpler than the other one, sometimes it lo doesn't look like, but it has some simplification because we have removed something which is physically meaningful. So this tensor, also will have an invariant. And this one we call J1, J2, and J3. Okay, for the strain, we call it E1, E2, and E3. I didn't put it here. Now, if you take Hooke's law again, and if you use the definition of deviatoric stress and the definition of deviatoric stress invariance, Hooke's law with the shear stress modulus, with the shear modulus, not the shear stress modulus, this is relating between shear stress and shear strains. Okay, so then we write down the specific elastic energy again, as we had it before. So that's the long definition. And then actually you will find that J2 and elastic energy are related to each other with this prefactor, which is one plus nu over E bulk modulus. Okay, so J2, you remember the second invariant is quadratic in stress. We have seen before that I can express energies quadratic in stress. Okay, so that makes sense. So stress to the power two uh, gives us an energy. And this one is the prefactor. So what does it mean? If I have a very soft material like rubber or polymer, then E will be small as compared to a metal. Soft material will have a small number here. Small E. So for a given stress situation, small e leads to a large energy. A hard material for a given stress situation leads to a small energy because we have to integrate over, over deformation and deformation will be small. Okay, so that's one of the things, think about the plausibility of this equation. Now, at the end of the day, I want to write it again in index notation. This is all the story about index notation. 
and the elastic energy we had already before. We had the definition of the shape change energy, so we can also insert this into the definition of deviatoric stress, and that gives us this volume change energy here, not shape change, I correct myself. This gives us the shape change energy with a G, if you want, the two and the two together make a four, okay, stress quadratic, or we go back to the original definition, which is deviatoric stress times deviatoric strain, and it looks exactly the same, only in the shape change energy on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, there are now the deviatoric quantities, the direction-dependent quantities only, the hydrostatic, the direction independent quantities have disappeared here. So the shape change elastic energy is something completely different than the volume change specific energy that are two terms. I add them up and they give me the total shape change, uh, total energy. I'm talking nonsense today, sorry. Okay, so that was 5.3 already. And this is about one slide only, practically about the definition of what means direction independent scalars invariance what remains in the stress and in the strain is per se direction dependent and this is all about shear stresses and shear strains and shape change okay everything which does not contribute to vol volume change will contribute to shape change so we split up the world in two things volume change shape change okay so remember this that will be part of practical exercises in some of the examples. Deviatoric stress, you should remember the definition. It's given on the formula sheet, but you should a little bit know how to interpret it and what to do with it then.